Hello everyone, this is Suzanne at God Crochet and Chatter. Welcome back. I am feeling much better getting back to my old self. Still got a little bit of a raspy voice going on, so excuse me today. Today we will be looking at the book of Haggai. Two chapters, very powerful. And at the end of this study, I'm going to show you my cuddle doll I've been working on. I got a pretty good chunk done yesterday as far as my shoulder and neck would take me, right? But I got some done, and that's progress. All right, let's talk about the book of Haggai. The children of Israel have been in bondage for a very long time, and within two years of their return from captivity in Babylon, God's people had cleared the Temple Mount and completed the foundation of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. But when their neighbors, the Samaritans, saw how rapidly things were going in reestablishing their society in their temple, they mounted an aggressive campaign to stop the building, and it worked. Progress on the temple stopped for 16 years. Instead of building a house for the Lord, the God their fathers, the Israelites began building houses for themselves. Instead of seeking the Lord, they sought to please themselves, and none of their efforts succeeded. A sense of futility hung over them like a long winter of slate gray days. Wow. When we start looking to our needs and not the needs to others or what we should be doing, we get in a spiral effect and we begin to feel hopeless and have those gray skies. Enter Haggai. His prophetic words to the tiny remnant of returned exiles in the land reflected the observation of a wise king of Israel. How good is a timely word, Proverbs 15, 23. And that's what they needed. They needed a timely word at this time to get back on track. And it's always, always good to be an encourager. We don't always have to yell and bring the hammer down on people. But maybe we can ask questions, as Haggai did. As it turned out, a timely word was what the former captives needed. Instead of thundering at the people and threatening doom, Haggai spoke a word to their conscience. Do you see what is happening to you? Do you see how you have wandered off track? Think about what you're doing. Now, if we just stopped in our everyday lives and applied these questions, do you see what is happening to you? Do you see how you wandered off track? Think about what you're doing. Haggai spoke the right word at the right time, and both the leaders and the people responded. As a result, Haggai went on to prophesy mighty blessings. The gray skies parted, and God's favor poured through like a shaft of sunlight. It was a pivotal point in the prophet's fatherly, even pastoral role with the remnant of Israel. Haggai's messages were delivered during a four-month period in 520 B.C. Haggai speaks directly to Zerubbabel, who had been given the task of rebuilding the temple, and to Joshua, the high priest. But indirectly, his message is meant for all people who have lost the will to build. Now, if you take time and go back and read Ezra, the first few chapters, it explains how the king... Different kings said, do not interrupt the Israelites. They are to rebuild this temple. And Haggai's purpose was to call the Israelites back to the task of rebuilding God's house. But his message had a secondary purpose, illustrating cause and effect. He states that the people are struggling because of their disobedience. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes that are not worn. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. The reason for the people's extended delay in rebuilding the Lord's temple was not a lack of materials, money, or manpower. It was a lack of obedience, skewed priorities. The remnant had been freed from captivity to reestablish the covenant kingdom of God. And at the center of what that covenant was God himself. The people could not keep the national covenant without a commitment to establish God in his rightful place in the center of the nation. 
Only then would the people be ready to rebuild their own lives. God must be at the center of all things. Now, there are four priorities that are in the book of Haggai. The prophet addresses four major themes in his brief prophecy. Priorities. Haggai rebukes the people for their misplaced priorities. God had moved the heart of the Persian king Cyrus to allow the people to return to Jerusalem and reestablish a covenant community that would live in fellowship for the spiritual life of the nation. If the people selfishly continued choosing their personal welfare over God's, they would go nowhere. I know some people that they put their personal needs over God. They're always watching the stock market. They're always checking how much money they got. What is the next thing they can buy that will fill their life with emptiness and hopelessness? And they're in this trap. And it's gotten to the point to where they're at the point of divorce, threatening to take everything from each other. It's a very sad situation because their life is centered on their toys and pleasing themselves. Divine sovereignty. Haggai uses the phrase Lord Almighty to refer to God's God 14 times in this short book. The phrase can also be translated Lord of hosts. It was God who sent the people of Judah into captivity and then released them through his sovereign actions using other kings and nations. And you can read about that in Ezra. Faith and works. Haggai's prophecy is a good example of the balance of faith and works presented in Scripture. James 2, 14 through 26. Let me read that to you. Faith and deeds. What, is good, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accomplished by action, is dead. But someone will say, If you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. If you believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was it not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Cause and effect. God's people struggle to survive when they return to the land. Their struggle, struggles mirrored the consequences of failing to uphold the covenant outlined in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. Haggai's message connects their lack of blessing with their choice to abandon their responsibility toward God. What does this mean for you? Step back and consider. The struggling band of former exiles who had returned to their homeland after decades of captivity, seemed to encounter disappointment after disappointment. Life was supposed to be better, was it not? Where had they gone wrong? The Lord agreed that their lives were out of balance, saying, You expected too much, but see, it turned out to be too little. What you brought home, I blew away. God challenged the people to give careful thought to their ways and their priorities. This is good sometimes to do when we find ourselves in a time of disappointment. Sometimes we feel let down because we have pinned our hopes in temporary things instead of eternal realities. Discouragement can be a signal that tells us to pause and consider our true priorities. The things of God never change, fade, or turn cold, or slip through our fingers. They never disappoint, and God's 
will alone can we find the fulfillment, satisfaction, and lasting joy our hearts long for. Now, this was taken from the Dr. Jeremiah Bible, some of his introduction statements uh, from the book of Haggai. Together with the prophet Zechariah in Ezra 5.1, Haggai prompted the restart of the building temple building project. Once God's people were back on track, the temple was soon completed on March, March 12, 15 B.C. This, thus, this fulfilled Jeremiah's prediction of a 70-year captivity that lasted from Nebuchadnezzar's burning of the temple in the fifth month of 586 B.C. until the temple's new reopening in the 12th month of 15 B.C. I would strongly encourage you to go back and read the first uh, three or four chapters of Ezra. Ezra 6.21 So the Israelites who returned from the exile ate at the Passover meal together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord their God of Israel. I hope you've enjoyed that insight into the book of Haggai. And we are seeing that things are starting to tie together. We have, not gone, we have now gone through the books of Genesis through Haggai. Congratulations. We've been doing the study overview. I think it's been very beneficial for us. And we can start to see how things are starting to really connect and bloom out in God's word. And I would encourage you to stop, think, and pray. Think about the steps you are taking each day. Set your priorities in the right direction. Do not seek treasures on earth or seek fulfillment on earth because you will not find it there. All right, everyone. That's the devotion for the day on, on Haggai. The rest of the week we'll be doing devotions every day. And I will be interjecting my yarn projects that I am working on. Let me take a quick drink here. My throat is dry, as you can tell. Oh, that's much better. All right, this is what I've gotten done so far on my cuddle dowel. Now, what's going to happen, this is the head, the front and back. This is the body, and now I'm finishing the other head. And this is going to come up like this. Let me line up my body. Right, there's my body. This is, gonna, this is the body. This will finishing up being the head. I will attach these two together, and then on one side of the face, I'll make the wide awake, and then on the other side of her face will be the sleepy face. And uh, then there will be a bonnet with a little ruffle. I'm really pleased with the progress so far. Um, maybe later tonight and tomorrow I'll get this done. And um, my eyes should be in today. So... Yeah, it's just a cute, simple thing to work on and to, to you know, pass the time away. Just something different. I've been starting, you know, I've been doing a lot of big projects, and I thought, I need to do some quickies. Kind of make you feel that you're making progress, right? All right, everyone, that's it for today. It is beautiful weather out here in Rochester. I think it's in the 62 outside, so we're going to go ahead and get ready and go for our walk for about a half hour to get up and get some fresh air. You take care. God bless you all. And thank you for being a part of God, Christian, and Chatter. And Lord willing, I'll be back tomorrow with another great devotional. Bye, everyone. God bless you.